At a very high level, you could say that LMP sets incentives for everyone to behave efficiently in the electricity system. To be a bit more specific, you can think about this um, as a matrix with two dimensions. On the one hand, you have signals to generation and, and then signals to consumers. And on the other hand, you have signals to affect dispatch decisions. So when someone produces or consumes and uh, secondly, investment decisions. So whether a wind park or an electrolyzer gets built, where it's located uh, and so forth. So generation, consumption, dispatch and investment. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora. This episode of Energy Unplugged is a deep dive into the debates happening around the world at the moment around uh, nodal pricing or locational marginal pricing, LMP for short. Uh, This is a bit of a departure from our regular interviews with energy industry leaders, but follows on from an episode we did uh, a few weeks back on capacity markets, where we assembled some of Aurora's leading experts around the world to look at topical debates in electricity market design. So we thought we'd try it again with another topical issue. Now, uh, nodal pricing uh, is more common in US markets, for example, in California and IRCA, but in Europe and Australia, um, the design tends to be more zonal, whether that's a single national price or large regions within markets. Um, But the debate has really stepped up, particularly as you get more renewables onto the system, the academic zeitgeist seems to push for more nodal, whereas developers and owners uh, push back in the opposite direction. In the UK, the debate's been given a a kick forward by the electricity system operator, who've argued strongly this year for moving in a nodal direction. And in the EU, there are debates in Poland and starting up in Germany, and regulators are starting their regular review of bidding zones. It's also a topical issue in Australia. So we're hoping to unpack some of those debates around the world uh, and uh, help listeners in those markets understand the pros and cons about where nodal pricing has been tried in different places. We're aiming to cover what it is and what the alternatives are, what the pros and cons of nodal pricing are, uh, and the political and market context uh, for those design choices. So my guests today are uh, Hans Koenig, our Managing Director for Central Europe. Welcome, Hans. Hello, Dan. And Hans is joining us from Berlin. Uh, Hugo Batten, our Managing Director for Asia Pacific, joining us from Sydney. Hi, Hugo. Hey, Dan. And finally, Oliver Kerr, Head of USA uh, over in Texas. Hi, Oliver. Hey, Dan. So just very briefly before we dive in, um, Obviously, this is likely to be one of the more technical uh, discussions, so uh, buckle in and uh, get ready for the ride. Um, Secondly, as I think John said when we talked about capacity markets, Aurora doesn't aim to take policy positions. We're humble modelers, and our aim for this session is to have a robust debate, perhaps share some personal views or or thoughts about how the right way to approach the problem is. Uh, We think modeling can be really helpful in understanding these kind of design questions, but it rarely leads to a final answer. Uh, It just helps you think through logically what you need to believe to think that changes are either going to be effective or uh, ineffective. So that's the that's the caveats out the way with. Let's let's dive into the content. Hans, can you kick us off? What why is location so important in in energy systems in electricity systems specifically? Um, yeah, very good question. So to put it, to put it very simply, um, because electricity cannot be transported or stored for free. Um, and that means all else equal, it's cheaper to consume electricity close to where it's produced and when it's produced. Um, and it's good to have a market design that incentivizes that. Um, and the importance of that rises through the energy transition because the existing transmission infrastructure in most countries is built around large coal or gas power stations um, um, and connect these with uh, demand centers. And the renewables that replace these stations are often in very different uh, locations. So managing the grid and maintaining grid stability becomes uh, becomes more challenging. Germany is actually a pretty interesting uh, uh, example in that uh, in that regard. So um, obviously Germany has built quite a few re- renew or quite a well, quite a lot of renewables over the past two decades. Not as much as we would have liked to, but quite a lot. 
Um, and a lot of our wind is in the north, a lot of our demand is in the south. And just over the past 10 years, um, our, the, the, the network operators costs to maintain grid stability um, have increased more than tenfold uh, to now more than 2 billion euros uh, per year. And that's why a lot of people, myself included, um, are now saying that Germany needs to needs to move away from kind of this very um, uh, very monolith monolithical single zone design to something to where location matters more and location margin pricing is one of those location is one of those solutions for that. So are, just for those who don't know the German system well, are there are there any kind of differentials in your connection charges in different parts of Germany or in what the market price is, or is it just a completely flat price? Uh, nothing at all. So there's no um, uh, there's no location based connection charges. Uh, the price there's a single price zone. Um, uh, there's no other types of um, benefit from um, producing or consuming in certain locations um, uh, um, uh, rather than, rather than others. So and and this is really a big part of the problem. Great, uh, Hugo in Australia, um, no nodal pricing, but there are different ways in which location gets factored into the market. Yeah, so Australia has two primary mechanisms, I'd, I'd say. The first is what are called marginal loss factors, MLFs. And then there's also something called thermal grid curtailment. Marginal loss factors have been, I think, the dominant way that people have thought about locational price signals. And you know, as the name suggests, the loss factors on a line, the impact of the, the kind of marginal unit. And basically, you get a score out of one each year from AEMO, the system operator, and that can be plus one if, if you're close to demand a, a little bit, but it's typically below one to reflect your losses. Um, it's kind of come to the forefront because Australia is a long, very thin grid, uh, you know, huge, sparsely populated country. And so location potentially matters even more than, than Europe. And so some of these marginal loss, loss factors got very low down to 0.73, which essentially meant you lost something like 27% of the revenue for your renewable project in, in that year. And certainly that um, stung a number of developers. Um, so, so a couple of different uh, ways to represent location, I think, and I, I know we're gonna kind of get into the politics of it, but it, it, I think it is instructive. We had Ben Barr, who's the CEO of the AMC, the rule maker in, in Australia, and they're actually pushing for sharper price signals, Dan, as you said. So kind of what they're calling congestion management model, but it's getting closer to nodal pricing. There are a couple of other models they're thinking about. But basically, MLS did sting existing assets, and particularly those that were less experienced in the Australian market. So some of the infra funds, but also newer renewable developers. Um, and often it wasn't entirely their fault. They built a long way from demand, but also they had projects come in after them, build nearby, and therefore their marginal loss factors were worse than they could have anticipated at the time. So they're pushing to move from marginal to average loss factors, so a slightly less sharp locational signal. Meanwhile, the AMC and the Energy Security Board are at least suggesting that we, we need to sharpen the, the nodal signals. At the same time now, you have state governments building what they call renewable energy zones. So these are a, a set aside parts of, of the Australian kind of outback or, or country, essentially, where they plan to build gigawatts of wind and solar, where there's with good resources of both, and coordinate the development of transmission and generation at the same time. And they are planning at least to offer flaws on marginal loss factor and, and thermal grid curtailment as part of the deal of building in those reses. So there's a lot going on there, right? Developers pushing for less price, sharp price signals, the rule makers thinking about more and state governments doing their own thing to build out gigawatt scale renewables in, in a timely way. So the Australian context is, is messy and, and there's certainly not a united view on what needs to happen next. Yeah, and that has some resonance with the, the UK debate where, I mean, similarly, there are network charges to NUOS, uh, others as well, but that's the, the, the biggest one for connecting to the, the transmission system and, you know, initially designed to sort of penalise you for locating away from the system and therefore driving more reinforcements and so forth, softened incrementally uh, because it would have penalised renewables built out at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the edges of the system. Um, but also actually fundamentally penalizing you for the distance from the historic system rather than the destination system mm. to which we need to, to move to. Um, but the debates hotted up because whilst that gives you some signals as we'll go on to talk about, 
um, about lo about location. It doesn't it doesn't incorporate it into the market. It's a separate sort of network connection charge, um, and we'll we'll come on to look at some of how that difference uh, how the difference plays out in other markets. But the other thing to mention, just to complete the set, I guess, is um, it, it, more common in in different parts of Europe, whether that's Italy, the Nordics, are um, are subnational zones uh, that um, you know, are not over large areas like the whole of um, Great Britain, as we see, but are sort of smaller zones that um, have set different prices within, for example, Italy or, or, or the Nordics. That's a different way of dealing with some of the some of the differences um, that we see. Um, but let's 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 get you know let's get into LMP then. Um, Oliver, you, you've seen it operating in, in different ways in the US. Um, what's the what's the definition? Uh, how would you differentiate LMP from the systems we just talked about? Yeah, so I mean, in very simple terms, a nodal market is one in which the price of power reflects the value of that power at a specific location at a specific point in time. So that's in contrast to the zonal markets you've just been talking about, where all power produced at the same point in time will receive the same price regardless of location. So in other words, not all megawatt hours are created equal. Uh, locational pricing takes into account some of the physical constraints in moving electricity around rather than just assuming that the system is one big copper plate where there's no transmission constraints and then leaving system operators to tidy up that supply demand imbalance at the local level you know after gate closure where do we see these operators i mentioned ERCOT. Where, uh, are there other places and, what, and are the design features identical or are there things that vary between those different market designs yeah exactly so i'm, I'm based here in texas i spend all my time on the us and in many ways, it's the home of nodal markets. All of the competitive ISOs here have made the transition from uh, zonal to nodal. Uh, you know, other examples around the world include places like New Zealand, Singapore, Argentina. Uh, I think your your point is a good one, though, is not all nodal markets are created equal. I think there are some things that are fairly universal, things like central dispatch. You know, typically, these are markets that are already uh, fairly liberalized and have a fairly sophisticated system operator. But I think there are also some important differences. Um, probably the most critical of those, or the one that has the most variance, is the extent to which the demand side is fully exposed to locational signals. So just to give you a couple of examples, PGM is, is what you might call a full no nodal market where both generation and load is exposed to locational pricing. In ERCOT, for example, only generators are exposed to nodal pricing. So load serving entities will pay a load weighted average of all of the nodal prices within a specific zone. So slightly less sharp signal on the demand side. Great. Okay. Well, let's let's talk through some of the some of the arguments in favour of LMP that its proponents um, its proponents make. Uh, Hans, what would you say are the main arguments in favour of LMP that you've heard in the debates uh, across Europe? Mm. So at a at a very high high level, you could say that um, uh, LMP leads or sets incentives for everyone to behave efficiently in the electricity system. Um, to be a bit more specific, you can think about this um, as a matrix with two dimensions. On the one hand, you have signals to generation um, and, and then signals to consumers. Um, and on the other hand, you have um, uh, signals to affect dispatch decisions. So when someone produces or consumes um, and uh, exactly investment decisions. So uh, uh, whether a wind park or an electrolyzer gets built, where it's located uh, and so forth. So generation, consumption, dispatch and investment. Um, and different models, as you've said, um, can help with some of these things. So for instance, you can use uh, grid charges uh, to steer investments or permitting rules or, uh, or something like that. But nodal pricing is very appealing because it's theoretically the most efficient possible system that solves all of these problems um, together um, because every generator gets paid the benefit they contribute to the system and every consumer faces a price that is comprised of the cost of generating a megawatt hour of electricity and bringing it uh, to a given location. And that means good incentives basically along the entire matrix which I outlined just now. So if electricity is scarce in a certain location, um, it becomes attractive to first ramp up your generator, decrease demand. Um, and if the scarcity persists for longer, you just build more generation in that location, right? Um, uh, conversely, if electricity is plentiful in a certain generation, 
Firstly, more, more expensive generators uh, ramp down uh, flexible consumers, such as electrolyzers or electric vehicles, uh, would ramp up their consumption. Um, and if they're still persistently cheap, uh, you might even incentivize new demand to move there, such as an energy-intensive factory or an electrolyzer or something. So it solves the um, it solves the efficiency problem um, um, for consumers, for producers, for dispatch, and for investment. That's a really, really great summary. We'll, we'll dig into all of those in, in a second. But Hugo, I know you've, you've read some of the literature on this. How big are these theoretical benefits? Yeah, and, and look, as you said, Dan, I think academics appreciate the purity of the, the of nodal pricing and are instinctively drawn to it, whereas anyone actually trying to build a, a solar wind farm usually thinks the opposite. The, the literature views I've read suggests there are something like one to four percent benefits in operational costs which clearly when you're spending billions of dollars every year is is actually massive i'm a little bit suspicious because i i don't think they factor in things like changes to cost of capital that that might emerge as you essentially put another form of, of risk onto developers and owners um, some some do factor that kind of analysis in, but some don't. But but so the benefits are like, you, you know, can be material. I think it's worth noting though that even nodal pricing doesn't fully incorporate or reflect network costs because it's essentially reflecting the short run and not the long run network costs. So nodal in some ways is again the academic literature says that we're reflecting only somewhere between thirty or forty percent of the costs. So in some ways, even nodal is underestimating the network costs that would be required to create a more copper plate system, in, 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 and that will depend on the market, obviously. The, the point I'd make is I think when you implement nodal matters in the evolution of an energy system, I think if all of us, I suspect, were starting with a complete clean sheet of paper and no generation, you'd probably start with nodal and you'd set up the rules of the game in in that way. And because locational signals are inherently helpful, as as Hans said, to both supply and demand. I think where they get less useful is if you think you've actually built out a lot of your infrastructure already, like in a kind of thought experiment, if you had built out 99% of your renewable generation and all locational decisions had already been made on the supply side, well, then at that stage, you might not bother to implement um, n- nodal pricing. So I think it, it does matter a little bit in terms of efficiency gains, where you think you are on the arc of build out of your generation and, and your demand as, as well. And so, I, you know, different uh, jurisdictions are, are at different places on that. I, I do think in the Australian context, for example, we build out a lot of renewables, just like Germany. But if you genuinely think demand is going to double as we electrify the rest of the economy, and that we need to build out you know, tens of gigawatts in the next 10 to 15 years. Well, m- you know, maybe it's not too late then to get sharper locational signals because building stuff you know, in the best locations is, is really going to matter for that scale of investment. So I think when you are thinking around the theoretical benefits, obviously you've got to have a look at the state of your market and, and where you are in, in the evolution of decarbonisation. And that sort of talks to particularly the investment signals that it's it's sending. And if you know, essentially, if you've already plonked something somewhere, then it's, there's limited benefit in sending a signal to put it somewhere where else. I mean, I'd be interested to hear people's different views about where the where the real benefits are here. Is it is it the signalling on uh, investment or on the on the dispatch side? Um, Oliver, one thing I wanted to sort of bring you on straight away on the on the generation side is an argument I've heard, um, uh, uh, and um, Hugo just nodded towards it actually, which is that. It, nodal systems inherently make it harder for an investor to see what their returns going to be because someone could come along and put another generator next to them and change the price in in the market. Um, it's how does that work in the US? Is is that something we see inherently higher cost of capital for for investment cases there, or or is it overstated? Yeah, I think I think it's a really tough question to answer. I mean, in in theory, the 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 question around investment decisions. You know the theory is easy to grasp, right? If I, if in a nodal market I stick my plant in the windiest location, but it's in the middle of nowhere, you know each megawatt hour I produce is less valuable to the grid, and the price I'm going to get reflects that. You know if I'm curtailed and I can't actually produce because the lines are congested, I also bear that risk as a generator, as opposed to in a zonal market where that's, you know, some of those costs tend to be socialized. 
But I think that does have two really big implications. Like you say, I think the first is uh, precisely that increasing complexity. This is something that at Aurora we've been dealing with a lot over the last 12 months. You know, not, our has 9,000 nodes. Market outcomes at the local level are extremely sensitive to, to small changes in generation, load, transmission. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of the last year integrating our main market model with our transmission model that, you know, that generates nodal pricing through power flows. And the results from that tend to be quite sensitive. So second, as a result of that complexity, there's an argument then this translates into increased risk and, and higher cost of capital. Um, I mean, I've had a look at the literature. I don't think there's a particularly clear answer. It is hard to control for other factors. I mean, certainly if you ask generators and investors, they'll tell you that nodal markets certainly do increase risk. Um, I mean, still there are financial instruments you can use like hedges, like, you know, congestion revenue rights, sometimes called you know, FTRs or financial transmission rights uh, that you can use to manage risk. Um, I mean, I suppose at the macro level, you could say the cost of capital in the US is higher than in Europe, but it's hard to say how much of that is down to nodal market versus just broader um, trends in, in infrastructure investing and you know capital markets. It's interesting you bring up the various financial instruments, Oliver, because I think that's a really important part of the story, you know, the F F FTRs in particular. I mean, it is worth noting that they are, you typically can't trade those anything more than kind of one to three years out. And, and so they help in the short term, but they certainly, you know, there are limited ways to manage what's called hub to node basis risk in the US over the long term. So the theory being, you know, nodal risk should sit where it can best be born. Well, yes, developers and owners, asset owners can, can do that in the short term, but it's very difficult for them to fully manage that risk over the long term. So there's the financial hedges in there, but there's also physical hedges such as such as batteries and storage, right? So um, yep. I've had a I've had the developer of some renewables assets in the panhandle in in Texas complain to me. Uh, um, I think it was last year that for every wind park they build there, they have to build a battery, otherwise it's not viable. Um, and that may feel painful from the developer's perspective, but from a system perspective, I'm saying, great, because you're internalizing a cost you would otherwise be putting on the system. And uh, if the project is still economic with the battery added in, uh, that's probably the sensible thing to do. No, exactly, Hans. And, and certainly I don't think any solar developer in Australia is looking to build a solar asset with at least without at least having the option of a battery. And part of that is actually managing the duck curve, which is quite extreme in Australia, but it's also managing marginal loss factors and thermal grid curtailment, which as I touched on before, are the, are the locational signals in Australia. So you, you're totally right. Financial hedges and, and physical hedges need to be thought about. I mean, this is a really interesting point in the, in, in the, in the context of, I think the first time you look at sort of nodal pricing, you think this is going to tell you where to put your generation, right? And actually what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily because for one reason you might it might be actually signaling you you put it where you put it but then you think about what other assets you want there as a physical hedge or what other financial transmission rights you want and you know certainly another argument would be you, how many choices have you actually got about where to put your wind farm in a country like the uk where the, the wind is just higher in scotland um you know and yes of course we're building out a lot of wind off the east coast but that's a sort of binary choice if you wanted to make a regulatory direction whether to go to one or to the other you could just you could just you know, say it should go there. I think the pitch would be different in the UK if we allowed onshore wind, where there'd be some genuine choices about where you located uh, wind. But actually, you're, quite a lot of the capacity is being forced into particular areas anyway by, by the nature of the, the, the physical um, requirements. I, I don't know whether it's the same in other markets, because uh, perhaps yeah. there's no choice in Australia. Yeah, it's a really good point. But I think even in Australia, right, which you assume is massive and sparsely populated, You'd assume, look, I've got lots of choices as to what, where I locate my wind and solar farms. But even in Australia, the, the issue of social license is maybe the, the dominant one in the renewable debate now. Farmers, landholders are pushing back very hard, both on renewable assets, but also the, the masses of amount of transmission that's needed. And that's why, and I touched on this before, these renewable energy zones have come to the fore, right, where you can plan it get social license kind of done in one systematic integrated way. You can build out the transmission in an integrated way, but then you're essentially taking locational choice away from 
asset developers in that state because you're really incentivizing them to build in these renewable energy zones. So as I said, in some ways, the rule makers are pushing for sharper prices. And in other ways, the state governments are saying, no, 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 we, we want you to build here because we, we want to build at scale, but we're deeply concerned about social license concerns and, and reses are going to help us solve, solve that. Right, right. That's really interesting. And I'm interested on the demand. So we should perhaps spend a bit more time interrogating that argument as well, because, you know, I, I actually wonder whether you're, that might actually be more mobile in the long run. Um, you know, so clearly people aren't going to uproot their homes, but actually there's quite a lot of energy intense uh, industries that are sort of going to be developed for net zero, like hydrogen production, for example, which, you know, has some choices about it. I mean, is it possible that that's actually the the bigger part of the investment signal we want to send here? Absolutely, I think so. Um, I mean, just I mean for for the European or the or the German example, like realistically, I think a lot of the existing demand uh, won't be mobile. Like, uh, households are unlikely to move to uh, to a location where the where the power prices is, is, is a little bit lower. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate uh, the importance of making sure that the, the new demand that arises um, is located in the in the right places. And so if you look at our net zero scenarios for various countries, uh, you'll see that power demand could easily double from uh, current levels in a, in a, in a lot of places uh, through electric, electrification of heating, industry, transport, uh, hydrogen production. And uh, a lot of this demand can be quite flexibly located. Um, and if we put it in the right places, it can save us a lot of money on, uh, on, on grid expansion. Conversely, if we put it in the wrong places, um, it can cost us a lot in additional grid and little additional grid management costs. And this is um, a big debate um, I expect we'll have in Germany over the next year or two, because there's currently no incentive whatsoever um, uh, to not put an electrolyzer somewhere in the south, um, sign, a, sign a PPA with an offshore wind park in the north, uh, and just basically run that through um, through the center of the country, which is grid constrained, where you, you'll be causing uh, massive uh, massive grid management costs. Right, right. I mean, I mean, to put the counter argument in hands, I mean, shouldn't we just build some more wires? Um, so I think we should absolutely build more wires, and uh, I don't I don't know of anyone who is suggesting that uh, LMP means we don't have to build any more wires uh, to decarbonize. Um, I think I think the choice we're facing is really um, between building a large amount of uh, new wires and a huge amount of uh, new wires, um, yeah. and uh, and so LMP or in general locational price signals help help us to reduce the amount of new wires we need, um, which saves us both money and is popular with the people. And this comes back to uh, the social license point, which Hugo made. Uh, I think one thing is clear across all the geographies I look at in Europe, in the US, uh, in Australia, people don't like looking at or living near transmission. Um, so minimizing new transmission construction, I do think is, 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 is a very important thing to maintain uh, maintain political support for the energy transition. But yes, we will need Quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of it anyway. Even with LNP, yeah, it's a great point, isn't it? And, and then we so often come back to that point in the energy transition. It's it's hard, so it's it's and and. You need to do both. You probably need to build the wires, and you probably need the the signals as well. I, I do think, though, and I'm sure it's the same in the jurisdictions you guys operate in. It seems like in Australia, whatever we estimate the cost of a transmission line is, by the time you get to start building it, it's at least doubled. And then by the end of construction, it's probably tripled. And, and I'm talking in very round numbers here. And it's because there's very long distances in Australia, but I'm, I'm sure there's you know, a range of challenges in Europe, including the dense population. So it is, it is increasingly difficult in Australia to get transmission lines built, both because it's expensive, but also because there's quite strict regulatory tests about social welfare benefit and environmental impact and, and a whole pile of other different different things so Hans as you say the difference between large and huge amounts of transmission is maybe mm. even more money than, than we estimate at, at the moment for for those reasons um, and that's also and I, true in, in California I think that's particularly clear in the case of batteries as well um, so in a nodal market if you do have persistent congestion in a particular place the you know transmission is not the only answer anymore and that is driving a lot of battery investment decisions in, in some of the markets that we're looking at like our 
yeah and indeed we see similar things on long duration storage as a means of, of managing um some of the sort of system challenges that we've got with the sort of lags to to, to system build out in in the uk in fact one of the things that intrigues me most is the suggestion i've heard from i mean it's fairly early suggestion but the suggestion i've heard from some people looking at building electrolyzers actually offshore that potentially uh it might be cheaper to build a pipe uh for the hydrogen produced offshore or, or to reuse an old pipe that's been used for the the, the gas industry historically than it is to build a, a really large wire to a different location and then electrolyze it near demand and i think that's an interesting choice of how you transport energy around through the different vectors that you you don't get out if you just simply commission wires I, well I, I think it is interesting though because in, in some ways there is a bit of a tension here because in exactly the same way the aussies are talking about building hydrogen electrolyzers at these renewable energy zones i've touched on right so coordinating generation transmission and demand but in in some ways you, you know they're, they're countervailing impulses here right nodal pricing you know, let's make give people the information they need to make good decisions. So put the risk back on the private sector. And in other ways, you can see this kind of countervailing need to, to better coordinate this infrastructure so that we are, you know, building stuff in the same place at, at the same time. So there's, as ever with energy, there's, there's countervailing impulses, I, I think, within this debate. Yeah. But I, I, just to build on that, I think one of the great benefits of LMP is actually that it makes the benefits of this coordination uh, explicit um, mm -hmm. because you can actually see how much uh, or you can model and then uh, you can build it and then you can see it, see it in practice how much the value of electricity uh, in a certain location rises because you build transmission there you build an electrolyzer and a hydrogen pipeline um, there and so forth and I think a lot of a lot of these benefits of, of coordinated infrastructure um, investment uh, get kind of get washed over in zonal systems and in, and in, and in nodal systems, you, you make it really explicit. Yeah, I think the other place which we should talk to a little bit more you mentioned before where you really are making explicit the sort of costs on the system and the, and the, and the value that um, people locate at the right place at the right time is um, it can provide is, is in the dispatch efficiency. So we talked a lot about the the investment, but um, mm. how, Hugo, how, how big an issue do you think is dispatch efficiency is in that sort of one to four percent gain that you talked about if you've got your investments in the right place? Yeah, I, I, and look, I mean, obviously it's hard to say, but clearly it does increase incentives for assets to be proactively managed and, and dispatched. In Australia, for example, we've certainly seen the rise of algorithmic trading, not just for batteries, but actually for renewable assets to bid around location-based constraints. Um, and again, that is a good thing um, and, and certainly has, has increased the efficiency of the system. But again, it's, it's hard to say how much. We, we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but it's, it's also, I think, in terms of dispatch, important to think about like market power at each of these nodes and, and the ability of assets to, you know, d dispatch in ways uh, that, that are less efficient for the system. Typically, you know, for example, California has a, a kind of additional element of its dispatch that looks at market power at the node and making, sh making sure that people aren't abusing of a potential market power at any given node. And that seems to work, but again, I haven't seen any kind of literature that describes the tension there between greater efficiency and the potential abuse of market power and then how effective market power uh, assessment, real-time assessments are in, in fixing that issue. Hmm. I think that's actually a great point. And I think that clearly in an oddle market, there is just a structural issue if, if you're making, you know, the, at the local level, there may be just insufficient competition that can result in generators gaming the system to maximize profits. Um, you know, one way to measure that um, is whether how much of the time is a certain generator pivotal, uh, and that tends to mean you know when is it absolutely required to meet load or satisfy a constraint at a particular location. So, uh, in ERCOT last year, you had pivotal suppliers in twenty percent of all hours. So you know, clearly, this is an issue. Like in reality, though, I think most U.S. markets have some form of regulation just to directly mitigate that. Um, so I think the main approach is 
through some sort of bid offer mitigation that you know typically the system operator will assign you a, a reference marginal price so each generator will will have a reference price calculated based on estimated efficiency and fuel price index and that you know limits bids too far in excess of that um, of course there's always loopholes so in our cut there's a so-called small fish rules so generators with less than five percent of the capacity are deemed not to exercise any market power so you do see instances of really small generators submitting these hockey stick bid curves and, and pricing up uh, as a result um, so, so certainly an issue great okay well i think we've sort of dug into the the main sort of arguments in favor of LMP and the sort of counter arguments about whether or not they're overstated or, or, or what the risks are there are a few others um both on the pros and the cons um i'll volunteer one but others jump in let's just sort of um let's sort of mention some of the perhaps less obvious ones I, I mean i think one that we're quite hard to value and therefore gets undervalued is just the just the the transparency of uh, having mm -hmm. that locational value clearly in the market i mean the uk system's gone from system actions being you know less than five percent of demand at any point in time really just truing up the system because the market's a fairly good representation of the actual physics to times when the system operator is having to redispatch two thirds of the demands. So, and not being very transparent about why it's doing it, what system needs drove that. And I, that, that feels to me hard to quantify the benefit of, of, of making that clear in the, mm. in the price, but you know, just fundamental to how markets work. Are there others you see that we haven't covered already? One of the things that comes up in, in Europe a lot in this discussion is um, um, the fact that, I mean, and we've talked about it on the, on the podcast, that in nodal systems, you face a, a lot higher risk as a, as, as a generator because you might have someone uh, construct uh, another wind park next to yours uh, and, um, and your, your nodal price goes down. But um, I think what a lot of people miss is that um, in, in zonal systems, especially if they actually reflect uh, grid constraints, you might face very similar risks because um, um, if, if, if the if the zones um, reflect grid constraints, the, uh, the, the zones will change, um, and you may find yourself um, on the opposite um, end of the border or on the, on, the, on the opposite side of the border um, in a couple of years' time and uh, face a much lower price, just as you might uh, in a in a nodal system. And this is actually exactly how the European system. Is meant to work. So every couple of years, the um, uh, every couple of years, the European regulators would run bidding zone reviews where exactly this is done. Um, and uh, so you might find yourself uh, in the worst of all worlds, where you don't have all the benefits from uh, locational marginal pricing, but you still have um, a lot of the um, uncertainty of uh, of being ultimately shifted to a lower value zone. Okay. So what about the cons? What have we missed? I mean, I think a lot of what we've been talking about has been that. Some of the cons are just that you can't necessarily achieve all of the all of the benefits because of the various mm. uh, constraints in the real world. Uh, what other what other things? Um... I, I do think switching costs matter, right? Like it, sure. to my point earlier, if you were starting with a clean sheet of paper, you'd probably go nodal. No one is starting with a clean sheet of paper now, and so you know every PPA in in non nodal systems is written around a you know hub price and and rewriting those will be challenging so i i think you've not just got to design a new market in some ways but you've also got to map out a fairly detailed transition as mm -hmm. to how you get from where you are to where you want to be and that is not entirely straightforward um, i know we're going to get into the politics in a second but there's a lots of spanners you can you can throw in that process i think it's a really good point and just to, an example from texas i think it took seven years from the first you know the regulator initially instructing the system operator implement nodal pricing in 2003 till it finally went live in 2010 you know over that time the estimated cost of implementation increased about five or something like 100 million estimated in the first instance to 500 million um by you know by the end of it so you know like hugo said it's, it's hugely complex you've got you know regulatory challenges you've got to rewrite the the rule book uh, write, write up the nodal protocols. It's hundreds of pages of, of uh, rules in, in a market like Texas. It's a technical challenge moving to central dispatch and the new you know, computational challenges that that involves and, and commercially as well with existing contractual arrangements. So it's, it's just a huge undertaking that, you know, that shouldn't be entered into lightly. I'm surprised it was that cheap, Oliver. And I, I suspect that might just be the central cost, right? I, I'd, I'd heard, and this was just a rumor that AEMO, the system operator in Australia, was looking at 
you know, in order of the hundreds of millions just to fix IT systems so they could dispatch nodally rather wow. than centrally, you know, and we're not even getting into the lawyer's fees to kind of rewrite every PPA and, and those kind of things. I, I'm sure they would increase exponentially, obviously. Yeah, that may have been just direct cost to system operator, but yeah. of course, second order effects are massive. Yeah, and, okay. then, and, and then I think just to build on that, I think the I think the third order effects of actually grabbing everyone's attention for a for a very extended amount of time, uh, and thereby people not focusing on actually developing projects, uh, getting them built, uh, driving forward the energy transition. I think that's actually with all, mm. despite all the theoretical benefits, I think that's actually one of the uh, one of the quite strong reasons against uh, moving um, uh, moving towards it because it would keep everyone busy for the next five plus years um, while we could be getting on with building things. Yeah, yeah. and and the completely agree, Hans. And the final one, or not the final one, but the, the one that I also think is liquidity in futures markets. We've talked a little bit about FTRs and other mechanisms that exist in, in the US, um, but it, it, managing hub to node basis risk, those markets are not super liquid. You know, there are physical hedges, but I, I think that really matters as, as well. So where the risk sits here, it, you know, is not always reflective of, of who can manage it. Okay, so it's a fairly nuanced picture. I mean, I, I'm not surprised that we're we're coming out here, but you know, there are clear benefits, both in theory and practical benefits, but they're not always realizable, and there are really serious issues with moving from one system to a very complicated new system. Are there particular circumstances when, either technically or politically, this is more likely to be uh, a good option for people? I mean, Oliver, do you think that the geography of a U.S. state like Texas is just more suited to a nodal? system than perhaps a densely populated European country like the UK or Italy? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question. It's a bit like the Australian example that Hugo gave at the beginning. I mean, there are clearly defined regions where it is just better to build wind and solar and, and having, I think, I think that's at least an argument for an, a zonal market, right? But like whether, whether you go all the way to nodal, I, I don't know if that's, a, you know, geography itself is a super strong argument for, for preferring one over the other. What is the defining feature? Is it, is it institutional capability? Is it, um, you know, the fact that you've got an ISO who can actually manage that kind of change and um, and can be trusted by the market? Or is it, do you think it comes down to politics? Yeah, I think it's political will. I think it's um, having a strong system operator. And it's also just, I think that if, if we weren't embarking on this huge challenge of decarbonizing grids and building out uh, you know, tons of renewables with low marginal cost. I think you know, having a you know, single price or a zonal market you know, is, is clearly worked for a long time and could continue to work. I think the challenge really comes in when you do start pushing those high levels of renewable generation, asking policymakers to manage some, or regulators or system operators to manage some of those costs on the back end. Uh, sort of retrospectively is is just just becomes infinitely harder it's not that it can't be done i think you could design a, a perfectly well-functioning zonal market where you know other mechanisms like network pricing can be used to send some of those investment signals it just the more renewables you have on the system the harder that becomes to do in an efficient manner and hans how do you think the politics will play out in markets you look at like Germany and, and Poland, do you think there's a, a, enough of a movement to move to a nodal system or, are you, or is there going to be a pushback that makes it harder for politicians to do? I think it comes back to the question of timing and where you see yourselves along the, uh, along the path uh, to, uh, to net zero or to, to a decarbonized system. Because as I think we've all said, it becomes very hard to do and also the benefits are lower uh, if all the generation and all the and all the um, demand has been built um, and Germany has built a lot of renewables right so we've, we've built 100 gigawatts plus but if you look at all the net zero scenarios that's probably 10 or 20 percent um, of the way we have to go um, uh, to to get to a net zero system right so so we're going to have to um, we're going to have to build um, a lot more renewables than we've than we've already built. So from that perspective, we're fairly early uh, in our decision to uh, to net zero, and there's actually quite a lot of um, investment decisions that can still be affected by 
uh, by a sensible market design. So what I'm telling decision makers in, in Germany is that the most important thing is that we get some uh, localized market signal, um, and um, there's there's certain there's certain pros of, 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 of pros and cons of nodals, which uh, which we've discussed today. There's there's, there's certain pros and cons of, um, of of smaller zones, but certainly the single price zone uh, we're seeing right now will not be tenable in the in the long run. And actually, the Polish uh, TSO you mentioned you mentioned Poland's uh, uh, PSE, they were among the first um, in Europe to realize this and, and really push for this and uh, so I certainly see a lot of momentum for smaller price zones or potentially even uh, even nodal being introduced in Europe. One of the things I was struck by when we um, interviewed uh, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, for our, um, our Spring Forum earlier this year was his sort of instinctive politician's dislike for customers facing different prices. It can be really... Um, disabling to the policy if actually you're coming up against a sort of instinctive feeling that, that consumers should have equal prices. Do you think, I mean, I, I think we saw some of this in, in, in Texas, didn't we, compared to how the market operates in PGM, there's a much less exposure to demand. Do you think some of these in other markets, um, some of these benefits get watered down because of, um, because of concerns about how consumers will, will view that variability in prices? I mean, I think that's certainly the case. I think that's one of the, the, the main questions around the politics of this is the extent to which you expose load to locational pricing and, and how that transition is managed. You know, if suddenly in Houston, you know, prices are going up 2x overnight, that becomes a real, a real challenge. Um, and there's an industrial argument as well. Like industry has, um, if industry is suddenly exposed to very high prices, it, it just becomes politically very challenging yeah. um so there's certainly an easier argument to make for just the generator side but then it's the question of you know how much are you losing out in terms of benefits from that from sending locational signals to load and, and where to locate in the long run i think on the on the pushback from from the ones who lose out and clearly someone will lose out i think i think the important point is that uh, there are ways of mitigating that and uh, you can you can re redistribute lump sums of money you can grandfather uh, cheap um, uh, electricity prices for uh, well, potentially forever, but also for, I don't know, for five, for five or 10 years um, for, um, for, for industrial consumers who, who, who would be um, uh, affected by that. And I think there's a lot of, um, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of examples of, uh, of, of household prices, of course, being, being completely pooled. So um, I think the distributional effects can be managed um, and you might lose some of the benefits, um, but uh, it's, it, it's, yeah, you, you still get the benefits from the, from the generation side. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think that reflects how I feel about it, Hans, actually, which is inevitably the, the, the art of these things is making those compromises and working out where, mm -hmm where some of the benefits need to be sacrificed because it's either a fairness issue with people who've made reasonable investments or it's just a, a sensible way of managing change. And I think it's easy to overstate the difficulty in the politics because there are lots of difficult decisions that we're going to have to take on the way to net zero and some some variability in, in prices for consumers within reasonable bounds is probably not as hard as some of the some of the decisions, if well implemented. That we'll have to make on things like lifestyle changes later on in the in the transition. Um, Hugo, are there any other factors you see from from Australian perspective that will make the politics either more or less difficult in uh, in, in in any kind of locational pricing change? No, I, I just made the same point I think I made about capacity markets that like implementation is really going to matter. I think you know us, but also you know academics and and other kind of talking heads on these topics you know, you're comparing idealized systems and, and all those kind of things. But, you know, I think there is a point, particularly in the Australian context, just about bandwidth. Like we're trying to manage the exits of coal, which is something like 60% of generation. There's discussions of various kind of capacity payments, transmission reform. You know, there is something about the bandwidth of regulators and politicians to manage multiple seismic reforms at the same time and deliver them well so i suspect as you're thinking through these types of big reforms you've got to prioritize and, and sequence and i just don't know at the moment in australia given where we're coming from whether there's just the, the regulatory bandwidth to really well execute complicated transitions to sharper nodal pricing i mean that is you know strictly just my view maybe europe and, and the uk which i think is further down 
the decarbonisation and evolution of its market path is in a better position to do that. But I think I think Australia would struggle at the moment. I think that's a really great note to finish on looking at the the sort of the difficult prioritisation decisions that I think regulators are going to have to make on different parts of the the, the transition. It, it's certainly an issue that we'll be looking at more and that um, I know a number of our clients quite rightly are, are interested in because it, it materially affects um, investment decisions and, and, and plans. But let, let, let's leave it there for today. Thank you all very much for, for joining the podcast today. So thanks, thanks Hans for joining us from Berlin. Thank you, Dan. And thanks Hugo for joining us from Sydney. Thanks, mate. And over in Texas, cheers uh, to Oliver for joining us with all the US experience. Thanks very much, Dan. That was Dan Monzani, Aurora's Managing Director for UK and Ireland, talking to Hans Koenig, Aurora's Managing Director for Central Europe, Hugo Batten, Aurora's Managing Director for Asia Pacific, and Oliver Kerr, Aurora's Head of USA. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.